I am so grateful for our friends at Blue Microphones. Not only have they completely changed what our show sounds like, they've given me headphones so I can monitor things better. This is the mic for millions of creative people, and now I know why. I'm so grateful for them completely changing the quality of our audio. You'll find Blue mics like Yeti and the mouse, which we're using here, both in pro studios and home studios, all literally all over the world. Their popular Yeti caster is a Blue Yeti microphone, plus a boom arm system that's behind many of your favorite podcasts. I see run into them all the time, and now I know why. If you've ever thought about creating your own podcast or YouTube channel, Blue can make you sound and look great. Just visit bluemic.com and click Get Started, and you can start telling your story. Hey, everyone. It's are. a dose of Dr. Drew. Hi, guys. Welcome. Uh, welcome our guest, Paul Webster. I'm watching you guys on the restream here as we get started. He's going to tell us in just a moment about Hope Street Coalition, something he and I have been chatting about for a while. This is uh, part of our conversation about homelessness and and again we welcome all sides of the equation all sides of the issue to come in and chat with us paul was most recently a senior policy advisor at the united states department of housing and urban development specifically focusing on homeless assistant program with um, within those programs paul has 12 years serving in the u.s house of representatives as a legislative and issues manager for several members of congress uh paul welcome good to see you thanks thank you Drew. great to see you tell us thanks about the hope street Col hope street uh, Hope Street Coalition is a brand new grassroots advocacy organization that focuses on the intersection of homelessness, addiction, and uh, mental illness. So uh, the real purpose is to engage with communities, uh, help people uh, find real solutions, and to advocate for solutions. You know, there's so many, uh, we talk a lot about housing, 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 and the great thing about your program, Dr. Drew, is you talk about the other side, which is treatment, uh, addiction, you know, the real suffering that's going on in the street. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who worked at HUD, uh, I could tell you that, you know, there's, there's billions of dollars that are going to communities uh, focusing on housing, but very little is uh, making its way to the folks that are you know, that's literally, literally, literally living and dying on the streets. Here in LA County, we we're losing five a day. It was three a day two years ago, four a year day last year, and now five a day. Um, I, the thing I find kind of extraordinary is that there's il the illnesses that are represented on the street are killing five people a day, and yet I'm not aware of a single physician involved in the supervision or management or even intervention for these things. I, am I missing something? And is, no, it, is, that, is uh, that unique to LA County or is that? No, no. And, and let me, the, the, real, the root cause of that is that we, in the federal government and in the rollout of the federal programs to the state and that the way that state agencies and local community organizations like LASA or other continuums of care, they, they look at homelessness as strictly a housing issue. It is a housing issue to be solved by housing. But but I the, well housing first they call it. But I, but I know they have uh, lots of social workers out there doing various kinds of services. Uh, and for instance, I'm aware that when they put when COVID broke out, they put several a lot of people into hotels here. In, I'm, I only know about LA County really. It's all I have experience with. Although I see what they're doing in New York, and it's usually it's a lot better. But in any event, they put them in hotels, and then essentially either a nurse or a social worker would come by every three or four days. Yeah. I mean, every, every federal homelessness um, program uh, that, that provides housing requires services. So the, the, the question is what's considered a service. Hmm. And, and there's, there's two ways to really think about that. If you look at the federal regulation, services can be everything from, you know, like you said, a social worker stopping by, checking in, hey, how you doing? Um, uh, to transportation, let's get you to this appointment, let's get you to the welfare office, whatever. So it's, it's, a, very, it's, a, it's a safety check, essentially. Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's very light. Uh, and, and the reason that it's really light is because there are other regulations in the federal policy that strictly prohibit the requirement of addiction treatment, mental illness treatment, 
or even you know things that you would think people would would want to encourage like workforce training um, engagement and support groups you, you can offer these things but you're you are prohibited uh, from requiring these things so we have a, a very very biased federal program and the billions of dollars that come down to the states they have to abide by these funding restrictions and and that bias basically says provide housing and some services but you know do the best you can and there there's a giant gap between requiring treatment for serious mental illness and motivating it finding it get, getting people in, enrolled in it so, so there's you know when i think about treating mental health patients i think about enrollment and motivation mm-hmm. that's not requiring anything are you not allowed to motivate well you're allowed to motivate in fact there's a you know there's a motivated con- counseling kind of component to this but but here's here's the problem <laughs> when you when you look at the population that is making up the uh, uh, segment of the homeless, people experiencing homeless that is growing the fastest, it's the folks who are unsheltered. These are people who are living on the streets. Uh, by UCLA's, you know, in 2019, UCLA had a study where it was, for my view, probably the largest objective study of unsheltered population. They showed that I think 78% of the, of the unsheltered population had some kind of mental illness condition. Another 75 had uh, a drug addiction connection. And you've talked about this, mm-hmm. you know, Drew. You've, you've, you've talked about how, you know, you can go and motivate and encourage and offer as much as you want, but uh, there's nothing that compels because uh, so many of the folks that are suffering on the street are so sick, they're unaware of their conditions. You, you know, right. you talk about anosognosia right. and, and the challenge that that presents. Um, right. in, in my little town here in San Diego County, there are 73, so about a town of about 100,000, there are 73 unsheltered homeless people. And of those 73, uh, exactly 78% of them report some kind of uh, mental illness and in about another 50 percent exp- you know report some kind of illness what does that mean report I, when you work in mental illness I'm, you, there's no such thing as reporting or questionnaires i mean that's an insane idea uh, you well, mean you, they actually ask the patient do you have this illness and that's then, exactly right well so, that's that's insane workers, that's that's insane it's also yeah and 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 so here's the problem the problem is is that you've got data that hud presents and says Here's the percent of the population that are experiencing mental illness. Here's it's all self-reported data, but let's just let's just go with their data source. When, when you look at Los Angeles and the Los Angeles reason uh, over the last five years, you see by their own numbers uh, a, a 35 percent increase in funding over the last five years, a 55 percent increase in homelessness a 73% increase in chronic homelessness and about a 70% increase in uh, substance use among the homeless. That's by their own numbers. This is whose number is this? This is Loss's numbers. Loss's number, yeah. And, and they're by HUD's numbers. Mm. So, hmm, uh, this is astonishing to me that you, you can't give people care do, do, do they, I just don't know how to approach this. I mean, do, do they ask, I mean, the organizations like American Psychological Association, American Psychiatric Association, National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, where where are these people? No, you, you got to understand, Drew, this is a housing issue. Stop making it complicated by bringing in reality. You know? Right. But, but, is, but where are the people that know the difference? Why, why are they so quiet? Are they afraid? I, I don't think they're afraid. I just don't think there's really any uh, handholds. There's really no opportunity to get in there. Hmm. See, what, what the federal government did, what Congress did in 2009, is they, uh, they statutorily created these entities called continuums of care. So in the LA region, LASA is the federal designee for federal dollars to go into the community. But but so, you got you got to know from a clinical standpoint, a continuum of care means highly acute, subacute, acute, outpatient, residential, 
That's what a continuum of care is. And that, that is exactly what's missing. <laughs> that is There's precisely no, when I look right. out there, that's precisely what I'd like to see. And is precisely what we don't see. No, you're, you're exactly right. The Kabuki dance theater, the PR in homelessness is, is just, it, it's, it's just unfathomable. Has, uh, have, has no one ever out. seen someone treated for mental illness or addiction that they don't understand that there's. I, I actually think, you know, there, there are, so here's the problem. There, there are good people out there. There are good providers out there who understand what's needed, but the funding streams and the restrictions are so onerous that they can only do so much. What do you mean? I mean, let's let's take a look at let's take a look at the other side of the coin of of the suffering on the street, which is, you know, the dearth, the absolute abysmal condition of our of our psychiatric and addiction treatment services. Yeah. Uh, so if, if you, you know, but if you go with 50% of the unsheltered have some kind of mental illness, or if you go with the UCLA data, that's 78%. Just, just, say, just, just say 30%, just to just okay. say 30%. I'm going to, I'm going to say 50% yeah. because it, it, I, I'm not too good at math. In, in, in this city, that's still tens of thousands of people. It, that's and, exactly and when the, the when the populace looks out across that and is upset by what they're seeing because people are suffering and dying, that's the group they'd like to bring into care. But okay, keep That's going. Right. Keep but so going. you got so let's just take LA as an example. You got sixty four thousand total homeless according to the last point in time account. You've got if you'd go by fifty percent, just because I can do the math easy, that's about thirty two thousand people who have some kind of mental illness. Thirty two thousand people. Cut that in half. Cut that in half. Let's just say sixteen to seventeen thousand people on the streets with a mental illness condition. In the entire state of California, we have 6,000 public psychiatric beds yeah. to treat these people. Yeah. And, and are those acute or subacute or across the board? Or, total. Total. Yeah, total beds. Yeah. Total. So that's a mess. And, and, and so. However, I do know people that are, are know how to um, scale this kind of stuff up, particularly for residential care or group homes with outpatient services. I mean, it would not be that hard to scale it up. And oh, it would no, not cost not. the and it would not cost the billions of dollars they're spending on on apartments and things. No, that's exactly the point. No one, no one is saying, no one is saying, don't house the unhoused. No one is saying that if you can't pay the rent, you shouldn't have some assistance and some help. Well, no it seems it's, that. but I got to say, it seems like anybody who tries to solve that problem, there's a group that rushes in and say, don't do anything. Yes. Which is yes. so hard yes. to understand. Yeah. The, 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 the housing narrative that housing is the one and only solution for all of these populations of homeless is what's killing, literally, I'll take your words right out of your mouth. Five this a day. Killing people on the street. Five a day. Five a day. In San Francisco, you've got drug overdoses of unsheltered. Five a day is just Los Angeles County. We got San Diego. We got San Francisco. Probably San Francisco has got to be four or five a day. Portland. Portland, Seattle. Yeah. yeah. All those. Things. So watch so the documentary. Seattle, Seattle is dying. If you want to see what what yeah. they find on the streets of Seattle. Same thing. It, 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 yeah. And this is the thing. It is absolutely <laughs> overwhelming when you think of the humanitarian crisis and humanitarian costs. Mm -hmm. We know this, but all of those things have been have been shoved down into this housing narrative that says housing is the is the cure it's the solution and like you said you know but, clinician, clinicians are out there saying you know how can how can housing provide a clinical yeah. uh, outcome it just can't right and we're seeing we're seeing are, are, I, I, I don't find many people saying that as are, are enough people saying that? Well, they're not, they're not, not what's, what's happening is we've disconnected the, the housing portion. The fact that, you know, it's, it's good to get people into housing. We've disconnected that with this, with the problem of psychiatric capacity. And so when, when, when people all over Los Angeles look around and see what's going on in their communities, they see what's going on in the, in the overpasses and the underpasses and on the, you know, they, they don't understand how these government officials and how these pro programs say, we're, we're going to solve that, but yet they see active psychosis and drug use going on, but there's a, 
there's a there's a prohibition against actually solving those problems with clinical interventions with, within the housing paradigm. And and on the on the on the clinical paradigm, on the clinical side, there's so little funding. And part of it is a problem of the federal government, part of it is a problem of the state government, part of it is a problem of county mental health departments. And so when you add all this together, what happens is the streets have become the dumping grounds for the addicted and the and the mentally ill. Right. Mm-hmm. And those streets it's, it's the it was the prisons, the nursing homes and the streets, now it's the streets and the nursing homes. They don't belong in any of these places. They That's don't belong exactly in prison, right. they don't belong on the streets, they don't belong in nursing homes. They belong in a continuum of care of some type uh, that's appropriate to the level of illness that they have. Like if they had congestive heart failure or anything else of any other organ system. So I have a question. What? Some of these housing committees and people that are housing are having good results with some of these homeless, right? It's not, not everybody is a drug addict or has mental health problems. That's homeless. Right. There, so, so there's families with children or, you right. know, maybe because of COVID we have more. Right. So, so seems... the average duration on the streets, and correct me if I'm wrong, Paul, for people that actually have an economic problem is three months, yeah. three months. That's right. And there's that's right. a lot of resources to help those people get going. again. And that's working, right? Oh yeah. So that's well, good. Let, Go ahead, Paul. Let's be clear. Let's be clear. It, it, it's kind of working. Uh, let, so so here's here's the great challenge that people need to understand. When when you and I talk about homeless, we, we try to make distinctions. Mm-hmm. We try to talk about how, yeah, there, there are people who can't pay the rent. Housing is expensive in Southern California. Housing is expensive on the West Coast. There are people who can't pay the rent. They, they can become homeless. Mm-hmm. But we also include in you know, those folks who were suffering, who've got illnesses and addictions and challenges. Right. And the Here, problem here's is that we my old, the my, old ra- like my old radio homeless. partner, my old radio partner made a great point one time. She said, uh, hey, wait a minute. We had 300,000 uh, undocumented immigrants show up at, uh, in Los Angeles in the last two years without a job, without ID, without family, without friends. And they all found a place to live. All yeah. of them. Not one well, of them. About, think about this. So I was in a council meeting once down here in, in San Diego County. One of the council members confronted this notion that affordable housing is the problem of homelessness. He, while he was on the dais, he took his phone. He said, uh, he said, look, I'm on, I, I'm on uh, apartment finder. I'm on roommate finder right now. Here's, here's, a, here's a room. Here's an apartment. I could get in for $600 a month. Here's one I could get in for eight hundred dollars a month. There is there is no shortage of the ability to get into an apartment uh, and share it with somebody like we did in college or when we when I was when I was separated and going through a divorce. I I did not live by myself. I lived in an apartment. I had to find someone to share the expenses of an apartment yeah. with. Yeah, yeah. People understand that. That's not the point. The point is. But we can argue this all day long, but it, it, it doesn't matter. What matters is there are people who are suffering and dying without treatment. There are people who are suffering and dying on the streets who are refusing services against their best interests. And the tremendous gaps, not only in the housing policy, but the tremendous gaps in the, the, the behavioral health side right, it's both. are keeping people there. Right. It, it's both for sure. So uh, I'm, I'm a little, um, I've got a million questions now. So one of them is we had a clinician at the char- in charge of uh, a HUD for a while. And you yeah. know, I've spoken to him at length and he was on this streaming show and he gets it. He gets what's going on. He sees it immediately. He knows all the signs and symptoms. He knows what he's looking at. Yeah. And yet he couldn't change all this. Mm-mm. Well, um, I'll, I'm going to defend my former boss a, a little bit here. Uh, <laughs> or maybe he did change it. I just we love the guy. Maybe, yeah, we do too. But, but maybe maybe he did change it. We just don't know. <laughs> you know what no, I mean? It's, uh, it's a lot of things. You know, um, Washington, D.C., changing anything in Washington, D.C. is a team sport. Uh, when you have uh, challenges uh, within your own, you know, within your own offense uh, at the agency, that's going to make things difficult. When you've got the, the you know, uh, folks not cooperating. It takes Congress. It takes the White House. It takes the career staff at HUD. It, you know, Secretary Carson or any secretary can't go in there with a magic wand 
and change a lot of these things. And, and believe me, I've got I've got uh, you know reams of paper with programmatic reforms that need to be done, including providing flexibility to local communities to say, look, if we want to if we want to require services, if we want to require sobriety in some of our programs, give us the flexibility to do that. That was one of the regulatory reforms that, that I was recommending, but it, it's a really difficult challenge. And, and let's just, let's remember, let's remember, you, you know this very, very well. There is a very active and very engaged uh, and uh, a very motivated um, constituency on the other side that is defending the status quo that does not want to see any any different types of opinions or but that's approaches. it's so weird i mean they, they're clearly it's failing whatever the current approach is it's a abject failure clearly and it's killing people and again no clinicians evaluating what might be done or how to try collaborate whatever happened to collaboration that word collaboration i that's so weird to me that we can't collaborate mm -hmm. and and problem solve anymore is that the world we're in that's it well, I think it is, but but I'll but I'll tell you what I what I also believe. You know, this issue, the issue of people suffering and dying on the streets, it's nonpartisan. Mm -hmm. uh, the ideologues uh, that are defending the status quo, defending the programs, defending the funding streams, uh, they they can be overcome. And that was that's the reason that I created Hope Street Coalition. We, well, we need I, I ran headlong into all that when I was appointed on the Lhasa Committee, and, and really. I think you know I didn't really want to be on that committee. I want to help change laws so we can actually help the mentally the mentally ill. Um, I was not – it's new information to me to – I got it from Andy Bales too, the same thing you're telling me, that you, you're not – you have to you – have, you're going to give housing, you have to allow them to do drugs, which to me is yeah. – it, 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 it's it, that one thing right there, as someone that treated tens of thousands of addicts and worked in the field for 30 years, it's a progressive illness that ends in death. If you allow it to progress, you're going to kill people. That's it, period. Right. Now, you don't have to treat them right that moment, but you have to have as your goal some sort of a, a, assisted treatment, some sort. And to leave them be using is, that's a death sentence. So, well, and then, Yeah, and then you have folks in the programs who have already established some kind of recovery. What kind of damage are you doing uh, by requiring the active addict uh, to be housed right next door to the folks who are seeking support and recovery. It, they, they just, there's just like you said about the clinical side on mental illness, there seems to be very little understanding None. of a Not. clinical and recovery understanding on, on addiction. Not very little. None. <laughs> <laughs> and and a enough. grave misconception about the progressivity of, of addiction. Yeah. Um, hmm. So here's, so here's the thing, you know, a lot of people will hear what's coming out of our mouths. Here's our conversation. They'll go, Oh, you guys are against affordable housing. Oh, you guys are trying to criminalize homeless. Oh, you guys are you guys don't understand, you know, the civil liberties of people to be able to, you know, decompensate on the street and die on the street with their civil rights intact. Mm. That that's not true. We understand those things. You know, this is you know, we're, we're, we we understand the complexity of the challenge. The problem is we have a top-down one-size-fits-all uh, pro policy and program. And what we're saying is we're saying, allow there to be some room for innovation, allow there to be some room for uh, shelter programs, allow there to be some room for addiction and treatment oriented for, for programs. Care. For care of sick people. For care of sick exactly. people. Exactly. Very simple. Yeah, uh, like you said, a clinical continuum of care, allow those things, allow communities to have that kind of flexibility to do things. But the, the way that these programs are, are very much like where some of the politics are going in our country, where it's, if you don't agree four square with where I am, you are verboten, you're not allowed to serve on committees, we're not gonna entertain your, uh, uh, your, your concerns. And, and I just think that, I just think particularly in Los Angeles, uh, people are so fed up with seeing the decline in their communities and they're so fed up with seeing the, the psychosis and the addiction and all the attendant crime and problems with that. I, I really have to believe, I have to believe in the, in, the, in the power of our constituency and the power of people that have common sense. I think if we could coalesce and, and, and get equipped and understand who to talk to and how to talk to them, I think we can start to overcome some of this stuff.
Well, uh, like I said, I ran into he- there, the 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 buzz saw I ran into of, of uh, atrocious people, really bad people, um, are continuing to this day to spew out uh, slanderous, libelous, false information about me out of fear that I would get appointed to that committee or that I didn't want to be a part of. Uh, you, you know, it's like, wh- yeah. I mean, you were honored, but it wasn't like you went out and asked for it. It was, I specifically honored. told her I did not want to do it oh, you at, did? Oh. at first. I said, yeah. and then I met with the department of mental health director who we saw absolutely eye to eye and everything. And, <laughs> and after that meeting, he sort of said, you know, maybe this, maybe it would be a good idea to get on the committee. I thought, well, maybe I could learn what they're up to. Even some of the stuff you're talking about here in terms of the HUD restrictions and that kind of thing, I could sort of figure out what. What's going on? What's happening to these three billions of dollars, and uh, why can't it some be used for treatment? I, I just would like to. I I told the the reporters that also misrepresented so d- disgustingly, oh, disgustingly. Yeah. I told them I'm going in with an open heart and open mind, just to be quiet and learn. That that's yeah. it. Well, that was my goal. It's, but it's they so, didn't report it, that. No. Yeah, and, it's so ideological. It's 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 not just it's why. Not just is this medicine I, ideological? When, when do treating patients with brain diseases now, become ideological? I mean, or human you know, I life. Think, I, I think a lot of it has to do with there's, you know, people are threatened with losing their funds. Program providers are saying, look, you've got to toe the line or else we're going to take the money away and give it to, a, you know, another program. I think there's a lot of that going on. Um, you know, Why can't we use of- programs that are there and have them adjust course, have them move more towards treatment or try to get some yeah. people in continual? Uh, anyway. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, just just look at it. Just look at it this way. Let's let's talk about just system performance measures. You know, yeah. or let's 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 make take objective measures and say, you know, we're going to give you more money, but we expect you either to serve a lot of more people that have a lot more life improving benchmarks. Or how about this? We actually are going to reward communities when, you know, various, you know, chronic homelessness actually goes down. And and we've seen this in some communities, but but Los Angeles seems to, in the West Coast, seems to have a real appetite for making this very ideolo- ideological and narrow. And it seems like if you only have that politically correct card, uh, you know, you, you, is is how you're going to be able to, to to play in this in this environment. Well, we'll see. Uh, you, there's another. You said that the HUD requires care, right, for the people that are housed. They were, yeah, they require some services. Okay. Now, this term wraparound services, which is a n- meaningless term, uh, essentially, it's what we used to do. We used to create for psychiatric patients. You don't create. You don't create wraparound services for orthopedic patients right. or for patients with dermatological problems. You take right. you, wraparound services are for people with brain diseases. But do we even, are we even talking about the same thing when people use that term? No, no, we're not. It's, it's, you know, it's like, it's like housing first, you know, people say, Oh, housing first, great concept. Love the concept. Uh, the definition of housing first and how it's applied is so different all over the place. You know, what is a required service is really up to the provider. So, so not to get too much into the weeds, but every year there's a competition that the, the continuums of care, LASA, oversees, and these different providers say we're going to provide X amount of housing. These are the services that we're going to provide with them. Uh, this is the amount. This is how you know the population that we're doing. So there's you know they do they do evaluations. They 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 evaluate and they they try to score these different programs. And the ones who have the highest scores are the ones that get uh, the most money. Hmm. And and so the the problem isn't that you've got this competition. The problem is the scorecard that HUD requires these local continuums to keep that are divorced from any kind of actual outcome metrics that will show that, you know, for example, people are are completing drug treatment programs. Uh, people are complying with, um, you know, uh, uh, med checks or, or med requirements. Uh, people are actually seeing their incomes increase. And, and These, wh- I'm getting confused. HUD requires this documentation or they should require it? You know, they, 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 re- they require system performance measures but the system performance measures are things like um, how many people got housed, how long did they stay housed. Right. Nothing that actually impacts right. people 
right. so that they can say, yeah, people are moving from, you know, a place of, of scarcity and homelessness to self-sufficiency or health mm-hmm. or sobriety or additional income. So those things, you know, some continuums of care actually track that stuff, but it's <laughs> the continuums of care just have, they're, they're unelectable, they're unaccountable, um, they're, they're their own little fiefdoms, and, and they're a part of the problem of actually... I, I don't, I'm, I'm getting extra confused now, because when I ran mental health programs, you had all kinds of requirements for reporting to the Department of Mental Health, to the state, to everybody, to JACO. Somehow these are exempt from that? Well, you got to, yeah, they, they, they don't take, they, they don't now, now to be, to be honest, to be fair, if you're a homelessness project and you have a medical clinic in that project, yeah, you're, you're going to be required to meet the certifications and the evaluations, et cetera, et cetera, to make sure that you're providing quality care. But for a lot of these programs that don't have those components, this is strictly a housing program. Is this person housed? How long did they stay housed? What do we got to do? Right. All right. So if that's okay, house? if that's the goal, why, when the uh, I guess the city councilman cleared out Echo Park and put placed all those patients, those people, and gave them services, why was that objectionable? Well, <laughs> that's a whole another side of the that's a whole another side of this conversation, and and that side is the side driven by uh, civil rights activists that essentially want to turn our public places into rights for people to camp and do drugs and engage in prostitution and exploitation because they believe that they have the the civil right to do that. I mean, when we, when we, when we get into this whole uh, conversation about, you know, dying with your rights on, that's a that's a whole another conversation that is now bleeding into the homelessness uh, conversation, because there is a political objective for people to say uh, people should be have a right to housing. So if I say that my tent on the ground in Echo Park is my domicile, that's my house. There are a whole army of civil rights attorneys and activists that say you can't deny that person's right of housing. Don't clear them don't move them, don't give them the treatment and even the, 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 the modicum of services. But that, how about the, uh, the, the housing? They're going to give them the housing. Well, that, but, but see, you have a right to refuse. I, I, if, I'm a, if I'm a civil rights activist, uh, a homeless activist, you know, I am going to advocate for the fact that I can set up my tent, whether it's on Venice Beach whether it's under the 101 freeway in Hollywood, whether it's in Echo Park. What is their end game? What's the end game? I don't understand. And the what game, and what does the, the game and what does a, the body count need to be before they adjust course a little bit? But what's what's their end game or what's their body you're, you're, count? You're, you're thinking about this all wrong. Don't think about it in terms of actually saving lives and and improving, you know, uh, healthcare or or even social determinants of health. You have to think of this to understand what's going on from a housing, socialized housing advocacy perspective. So what's their end game? What, what, would, their, end what game would their utopia a, look like? Their end, the a camping ground? looks like a federal right to housing. I know, but... Everybody should be No, I understand, but live. so they give them housing. But housing wherever you wish, if they say their housing is in my son's bedroom, that's their housing? Well, that's... that's yeah, now you're taking it to the next logical absurdity. But the, that's what's happening. You look at, look at Boise... Look at the Boise versus Martin decision. They ba- the activists basically said that when you take somebody's uh, tent or their their encampment and you pull it off of the ground and all the attendant stuff that goes along with it, mm-hmm. because they're living in filth, they're living in unsanitary conditions, mm-hmm. you know, all the medical and, and other challenges that go along with it. When you do that, you're actually violating somebody's rights. And so they're using this tool, they're using that to advance the idea that the only way we're going to be able to solve homelessness is just to give everybody housing and, and have people pay for it. The problem with that is that you, it, 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 here's, but, here's the thing that always astounded me. In, in California on the West Coast, the most valuable asset 
in, in for a long time is is real estate. Mm-hmm. They we're trying to socialize. They're trying to socialize real estate so that you know there's a distribution. There's a there's a there's a uh, a redistribution of wealth to the people who have real estate to the people who don't have real estate. But but the let's look, again stay with Echo Park. They were given a place to go. Is it because it's not? doesn't belong to them like the plot of land on the echo park they believe belong to them yeah i think i think what they what they were what they were refusing is why are you moving people by force why are you reclaiming public land when you know people should have the freedom if they want to live in the park they should live in the park if they want to live in a hotel subsidized by taxpayer dollars uh they should be able to do that what what they, I think they were objecting with is this this concept that if uh, if that if social workers and police and and the public you know public entities go in there and actually clear a park against people's will, uh, you're criminalizing them somehow. That's that's the challenge. That, now, that, that... now listen listen, all of this conversation is, is interesting, but. It, it doesn't get to the issue of, you know, it's nice to know what we're up against, but it doesn't get to the issue of how do we actually organize? How do we actually focus on things where we can move the ball? Well, um, before, before you, before you, I, I'm going to get there, but I have one more, I have one more okay. thing I want to get on. W- what do you make of that judge that mandated that everyone in Skid Row be housed? Oh, Judge Carter. Yeah, and and then you what know, do you make of that? And then what do you make of the fact that everyone in L.A. went, oh, no, you can't do that, and then they're going to sue him? Oh, I mean, I don't understand, but but go ahead. Yeah, Try to help me understand. Judge Carter's ruling. Yeah. So here's here's a guy here's a guy who is, you know, he's engaged. He's active. He, he, he wants to set things right because he believes that the right, the right interpretation of the law mm-hmm. is that Look, you you've got to do things right, even if mm-hmm. it's against what the government is saying right now. So I applaud that. I applaud people for for uh, going up against the status quo. I, I think that's a so, I think so that, he's going up against HUD. He, well, he's going up against HUD. He's going up against yeah, going against the city, going up against the county. And uh, and, and when they push Boston. back, what what are the grounds for the pushback going to be? Do we know? Well, they're going to say a lot of things. They're going to say that you know he doesn't have. The, that authority as a federal judge, they're going to appeal to the Ninth Circuit Court. Uh, the Ninth Circuit Court is actually, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a legal scholar, but I can definitely see how this could end up in the Supreme Court, mm. and the Supreme Court could could consider Martin v. Boise, or uh, there's another state, uh, or there's another statute um, against Florida that talks about the illegal, you know, um, seizure of of, of uh, people's property who are experiencing homelessness too. So I, I actually think that, you know, I, I, Judge Carter is trying to do what's right in his heart. Uh, he's saying, look, we, and I, and I, this was actually one of the things when, when I was working at HUD, we were trying to, trying to encourage the city and county of Los Angeles to do is say, look, you know, we're, we're not opposed to housing. We're the Department of Housing and Urban Development, but we also need to think about shelter. How do we balance these things so that some people can get off the street, get some of their needs met, even in a shelter because the humanitarian crisis is so large. And at the same time, you've got billions of dollars going towards housing. It, it, there, there's a very strange so, dichotomy where we can't walk and chew gum at the same time for some reason. So, so if I understand what these, the civil rights advocates are suggesting is that if you can't give somebody a home, that they are satisfied with you, not, not put them up somewhere, but give them their own property. Everything else is unacceptable. Anything else is unacceptable. Well, yeah, but but think that there's there's some there's a political agenda that's attached to that. The political agenda is everybody should have a right to housing, and you sh- and nothing should you know it should be a civil right, just like. You know the right to vote. Yeah, yeah but what right I keep, but I keep, what, what, what do we mean by housing? I think is what's at issue here because, yeah, the, the like question. in Echo Park, they gave them housing, they gave them services, no good. Yeah, well, again, let's let's tie this into let's tie this into what we know is happening in uh, in the field of of uh, behavioral health, mental health, and addiction. Yeah, we know that there's this concept out there, particularly among the mentally ill 
and and the advocates the the uh, the advocates for civil civil liberties is there they they promote this right to fail you know we shouldn't you know there there are some very interesting constituencies out there that are opposed to things like assisted outpatient treatment where someone would go before a judge and the judge would say look you are going to need to have medicine because when you don't have medicine you know you you are you are a danger to yourself you're a danger to others the court is mandating that you have medicine there are people who are opposed to that there are people who are opposed to conservatorship there are people who are opposed to guardianship because they equate mental illness treatment and i'm not i'm not making this up they equate it with torture they equate it with with doing things against the, the rights of people i'm sorry but it's an absurd concept but it's a concept that is alive and well in uh, some of these advocacy rights organizations and consumer organizations on the mental illness side. And, and, and my point is that the, the, folks, the folks who were driving down the street, driving down you know, um, any street in Los Angeles, uh, when they look over at the side of the road and they see the destitution, when they see how you know, the psychotic behavior, when they see the addictive behavior, when they see the exploitation of humanity, these people don't know all the ins and outs of behavioral health policy. They don't understand reimbursement by the federal government for Medicaid that limits the amount of psychiatric capacity that states can do. They don't understand this. All they want, they want their communities improved. They want mm -hmm. people to be treated and served. Mm -hmm. They want those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. but, but what they get instead is a lot of really harsh pushback for something that in their mind seemed really reasonable. Yeah. Let's house the people who need housing, who can, who can maybe get their GED, get into some work training, move on with their lives, get their families back together. Mm -hmm. And let's mm -hmm. provide appropriate housing for those who that's combined with treatment for those who are mentally ill and addicted, who are making up the majority of the people who are unhoused. Yep. So what were you saying about coalition building? I interrupted that. Oh, I just I just think there's a great opportunity right now uh, for folks who have been working so hard out there to change some of the policies and s change some of the laws with respect to how how people are treated with mental illness. I think there's a great opportunity to join those folks with the general public who heretofore have gone to their city council people and said, no, you don't understand. The issue is affordable housing. If you're not going to join with me on affordable housing, go away. And people are frustrated. They're dissatisfied with the kind of responses that they're getting because essentially they're getting gaslit by their own elected officials. Right. And so I, I think that there's so many good opportunities to focus on um, building a large coalition of folks mental illness reform advocates, uh, providers who are sick and tired of the local government, the state government, and the federal government from tying their hands, from doing what they know is right to do, and the general public to say, look, this is a humanitarian crisis. Let's all get on the same page. Let's start to identify the things that we can actually knock down, and let's let's start working on those things together. Um, you know, I, I it, we all we all spend way too much time on Facebook, but one of the things I know on Facebook is there are a ton of groups out there where people are like, you know, they sit there and they complain about what's happening in their neighborhoods and they complain about encampments and, you know, things like that. I, I want to take that energy and and move it towards something like let's provide more residential treatment facilities so that we can create beds so that the people who are suffering on the street in psychosis can get off the street and get the kind of housing and treatment they so, need. So you see the 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 uprising, the, the swelling that's going on in the average citizen in, the, in this area, right? And Absolutely, you're, yeah. And how do you capture that and turn that into anything? Because the, yeah. the elected officials clearly don't give a shit, and the uh, advocacy groups are hell-bent on... Mm -hmm. tr on people dying um so how do you how do you engage that the average person who is so mortified by all this i'll give you i'll give it a great example people of los angeles you, you have 
two members of Congress in Los Angeles. One of them is the chairwoman of the House Financial Services Committee. The other one, I think, is the third ranking. I think Brad Sherman is the third ranking on the House Financial Services Committee. The House Financial Services Committee has primary jurisdiction over homelessness policy. Mm. Now, I'm not going to get into you know the efficacy of asking Chairman Chairwoman Waters if you know she wants to to look at different approaches, but people need to be aware that you have. I mean, in the State Assembly, I think I wrote some notes down. You've got uh, you've got folks from um, Lake Elsinore. You've got uh, Assembly member from the West Valley, Gabriel. You've got. Um, you know, uh, assembly member from Fullerton and the, in the California Senate, uh, Pat Bates from Orange County is the number two on the Senate housing committee. You've got, uh, Senator Ochoa Ba in Rancho Cucamonga. You've got Umber, uh, from Garden Grove, Santa Ana. But you know, but you understand are, you're talking about the state legislature. I'm talking about state legislature. Nobody has any idea who their state representative in California. No one knows who their state representatives are. That's exactly they have, they have no idea. And That's those exactly and right. those people are ruining the state, well, ruining the state. They're the ones, they, and they, we they have no idea who those people are. That's right. So we're we're barking up the wrong tree. When we look at federal policy, when we look at state policy, and we go to our city council meetings and say, "You've got to, you know, we've we've got to fix this homeless problem." Well, to me, you know, if I'm a if I'm a city council person, I said, "Oh, you know, it's what Mayor Garcetti said." We've raised the budget for homelessness. We've, tr we've, we've raised it 100% in the time that I've been mayor. Okay, okay, fair enough. I'm going to give you that. What have you done, you know, Mayor Garcetti or this council person or that, to actually change the way that homelessness is, is considered a success, that mm -hmm. homelessness programs are actually considered a success? Mm -hmm. I think what we need to do we need to stop complaining in general, and we need to get specific about what specific things we need to do. You know, and I'll just, you know, I'll throw out a couple. Uh, we need to we need to impose on our our federal our our members of Congress from California, Brad Sherman, Chairwoman Waters, and say, you need to reform the continuum of care program. So the communities can have flexibility about whether or not they can require sobriety, require work, or require treatment. That's it. One thing. You know, focus on. And one what thing. about That's what about enough. what about again coalition building with some of the religiously oriented uh, missions and things that are out there? Is there any oh, ever man. any hope of that? Yeah, absolutely. The the rescue missions, uh, City Gate. Uh, network, which is which used to be called the Association of Gospel Rescue Missions, you know they they provide so many resources, and yet they're you know they do not have the constituency behind them uh, that will support some of their. So yeah, you're absolutely right. We need to build these coalitions with uh, faith-based organizations. Mm -hmm. We need to build coalitions with uh, with the um, National Association for the Mentally Ill. We need to build these coalitions with We're, these grassroots uh, reformers for mental illness policy. Have There's you talked to any of the? Have you policy. talked to NAMI? Have you talked to American Psychiatric yeah. Association? Or what does NAMI? And what does NAMI. NAMI say? Yeah, it it now here's this is this is what's interesting. They say we we love where you're going, Paul. We like these concepts, uh, but but let's let's be realistic. Um, a lot of these associations, a lot of these organizations. They get money from the county. They get money, and sometimes you you get challenges. You get challenges. Is like if if they if they speak too forcefully on certain policies, is that going to reflect badly on their funding for the year? So one of the reasons that Hope Street Coalition exists is you know we're not beholden to anybody. We right. we can speak the truth regardless of what the county is giving to this organization that, and and we want to be a broad coalition. We don't, you know, it, 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 there are, there are going to be members in our coalition who disagree on certain areas of policy, but that's why I think it's important to focus on the folks who are suffering and dying on the street. Right. If, if we, we could, we could have all kinds of differences in terms of what kind of housing and, 
you know, what's best, you know, rapid rehousing works or housing first is a great approach. We can have all kinds of conversations about that. Let's focus on the folks who are not being served, who are not being housed and the huge systemic barriers to getting them the kind of treatment and appropriate housing that is important for them. And you, I, I get, I get so discouraged when I, when I think about this stuff. I mean, I get just so. Well, yeah, and then even though if you have the housing, they won't go. Well, they, it, right. We can't force them. Well, we That's can't. Most of okay, so 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 here's my here's my attempt for that. Mm. The people who have become the, the 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 levels of government who have become the bill payers for the failure of not only homelessness programs, you know, state and federal homelessness programs but also because of the lack of capacity, the lack of services in, the, in, in mental and behavioral health are our cities. So, you know, you have a small, you have a medium sized city. They're the ones who have to roll emergency units, have to roll police departments. They're the ones whose sanitation departments have, have got to pay the bills for cleaning up encampments. Cities can be lobbied very effectively by their constituencies most people i hope you know your city council member at least the one who represents you or, or have an idea who they are i hope so but go to them and say look this isn't a city issue this is either a county issue or a like lantern and petra short the state legislation that puts such a high bar on how people who have obvious psychosis obvious demonstrable uh addiction problems you know, we, we can't get those people conserved because there's a state law that pro prohibits it. Why, why can't we go to our city councils and say, you guys are paying the bill for the challenges that Lantern and Petra Short is putting on. Let's pass a resolution in our city council so that we can say, hey, state legislators, if there's one thing that is really impeding our quality of life and harming people who are suffering on the street, it's the inability to get them the kind of care and treatment they need because Lanham and Petra Short needs to be reformed. Right. There, there are ways to do this. That would that a local official would be pressured to work on that. Why not? Why? Why can't I, you? I, we've why been up to the you? state. I've been I've been up to the to Sacramento. Right. And then right. The, and you know, there was Senator Morlock worked on that, and they were told, "Scram, get these families out of here. They have no rights." Right. But we need we need to. The, the, don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Every two years, we have elections. Uh, I've talked to folks and I've talked to different constituencies. Since, I'm sorry, constituencies in in uh, Los Angeles. They know what's going on. Homelessness is at the top of their list these days. The it, it, this is not a huge divide. We are actually very close to making things happen. Wait a minute. Wait. Wait. What's where is there? Where is there not a divide between the public and the representatives? No, I don't think there's a huge divide in terms of what people want and how close they can get there. I think that we're actually very, very close in terms of coalition building and focusing people. What's happened is on the area of homelessness, we have more people using Facebook and Twitter as a means of actually advocating than actually advocating. So it's one thing to be the person who sits behind a keyboard and says, I think we should focus on tiny houses. Mm. That's great. I mean, that's kind of my throwaway thing because in every conversation in every Facebook room I've ever seen, it's always about tiny houses. Mm. The, the challenge is it's um, the challenge is we need to focus on specific things. We need to coordinate our efforts. You don't you don't think that the, the, the folks did that when they saw your nomination in front of the LASA board. Mm -hmm. They they had a very immediate and very disciplined message strategy that said, dump Dr. Drew and generated letters to the board so that they had to act. I think that there's an opportunity to do that with combining the general public and other constituencies. And I don't think that it's far away. We just need to capture that energy. We need to get people to do two things. Uh, we need to move them off of their Facebook pages. I mean, look, I'm being critical of Facebook and social media. Everybody uses it, but it's not a solution. It's Twitter's a way to complain. Yeah, we need to we need to we need to take a couple of minutes off of Facebook and Twitter, and we need to actually write letters and pick up the phone and set up meetings 
with our city council persons, our, our, our boards of supervisor members, our members of Congress, and tell them how pissed off we are about the failure to deal with this. Hey, uh, um, just looking at the thread here, Ant Anthony Jackson, you cannot move people. You cannot move people. You understand? That's the problem. They cannot be moved. Am I overstating that, Paul? No, I mean, yeah, the, the, every, every community in California has been, has been educated, their city attorneys, the League of California Cities, the Council of Governments have gone ad nauseum about how it is against the law in the Ninth Circuit to take people off the street unless you have a bed ready for them. Well, not just a bed for them, that they want to go into. Well, that, and they have the right to refuse. Exactly. They have a right so, to refuse. And so if they don't want to go, they don't go. And that's what happened in Echo right. Park. They didn't want to go, so they didn't go. Even right. inside of having place and services. So Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, we hear it. We hear it all the time. We hear this whole thing like, and, and, it, and it, I don't understand how, I mean, I, I wonder how, people make the connection between realistic change, realistically moving the ball for moving the ball forward and these kooky ideas that they have that just have no basis in legislative reality. You know, you, you can't, let, let's just say it for the record. Hey, everybody, you can't, move, you can't grab people, put them on buses and move them out to the desert. Right. You, can't you do cannot it. do that. That's impossible. You, you also it. can't, you you're not allowed to arrest people for doing drugs or trafficking drugs. You're not you, you can't do that. That's not That's in correct. the law anymore. You can give them a citation, which they tear up, so the cops stop doing that. So the That's cops right. do nothing to the drug use, and that's fine. They don't belong in prison. Um, but people don't seem to understand all this. Yeah, you can't. You cannot arrest somebody for going into the CVS and stealing $800 worth of goods to support it's your drug habit law to arrest yeah. them for doing that. That's right. That's right. So, so here's the thing. I mean, we're talking about the consequences of prop 47 and prop 57. So instead of complaining about that, let's actually work to overturn those parts of the law that have been demonstrated by increased crime demonstrated by increased drug use demonstrated by increased shoplifting and and uh um you know the destruction of retail establishments that are targeted by uh these individuals by changing that law we can do it it happens all the time it's not easy in california I, no one's saying that it's easy but if you're determined if you think that this is a humanitarian crisis of our time it, it is it's tired of seeing your communities you know Growing, growing encampments. If you know, you know, I, I love I love uh, Carolyn Kay because they're just uh, you know they're amazing. You know, and Carolyn talks about how you know she says there's not a woman in Los Angeles that's that feels safe walking after dark in some of these neighborhoods. So oh, yeah. if you're sick of this stuff, if you're if you want to actually see improvements to people who are suffering and deteriorating on the street, then let's actually do some concrete things to get it done. That's my proposition. That's my invitation. Let's let's think con con constructively, decisively. Let's focus on messaging and let's get things done in a unified way. That's why I created a coalition. And and how's it going? What what what's the plan? How do we help? What's what's going on there? Well, I I do have to, you know, I I I I like to be passionate when I talk. Uh I've been doing this for about 3 months. I'm getting tons of folks uh, on my website signing up, you know, signing up for the newsletter. There's lots of opportunities out there. People are resonating. So uh, for a brand new organization, it's going well. Um, but I need, you know, we need more people. We need more people to sign up on the website. And so what is Susan, what's the show the website again, Susan, if you would. So hold on. Yeah, thanks for doing that. Yeah, of course. Well, listen, I, 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 I get more frustrated and more confused every time I talk about this thing. And is the website is hopestreetcoalition.org. Org. Yeah, Hope hopestreetcoalition.org. Hopestreetcoalition um, actually, just let me say this. I had a very generous donor say that for every dollar that's donated uh, through until uh, May 15th, we're kind of celebrating this new website, they will triple match it. Wow. So every $100 donation turns into $300. Every $1,000 donation turns into $3,000. So 
Um, That's great. If you like what we're saying, if you want to be a part of the solution, if you want to talk about how we want to end suffering on the street, I invite you go sign up, uh, donate. Um, you know, let me let's let's talk. There's a you know, I'm I'm in that mode Our where I'm just working hard to uh, to to get traction and to convince people that it's better to you know the old adage is it's better to light a candle than raise your fist at the darkness and that's what we're trying to trying to do here and and are there other uh opportunities to participate if you sign up on the website i mean what kinds of jobs are available or or what kinds of things do you need people to do well what i'd like to do is i just like to educate people in in very simple terms like for example you know we, we talk a little bit about the federal cap on um reimbursements for psychiatric care imd got resources on on explaining that uh but i think what really needs to happen is we just you know the more people that sign up and then i'll be able to come back and we'll be able to actually start organizing right now we're focusing on ending this thing called the imd exclusion uh that caps um the the reimbursement to the federal government so that uh there are fewer beds uh for psychiatric care than if without this cap so that's one thing that we can we can uh work on right now uh next i'm going to start working on things like uh um you know reforming the lanterman petra short act we need to develop coalitions so that people can push there so another thing that people can do is you know they can write letters to their member of Congress, to their state assembly person. Let's 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 you know I I've got templates that I'd love to share and say here's here's write a little letter. Here's what a letter looks like for Lanner and Petra Short. Here's a letter that uh, will allow for uh, organizations providers to do um, provide drug treatment and and um, and require workforce training. You know those kinds of things. So. Um, People can write letters to the editor. I'm happy to help with that. Um, people they, can, they won't people, publish them, you know. They won't. Well, they don't publish them. I, I understand. I understand. You just got to keep trying. We can do um, one thing that uh, is really been successful is I've actually been doing Zoom town hall meetings where I kind of go through, you know, the the funding, the capacity, the breakdown of the unsheltered homeless, and some of the challenges with some of the. Um, the mental and behavioral health stuff. So if you want to invite me to do a little bit of a Zoom town hall meeting in your community or with your Facebook group, I'd love to do that for you as well. Uh, we we got to get going. We Anthony got... Brown wants to be a part of it. Yeah, you got to call he Anthony said he Brown. Reached, oh, yeah. He I reached out. He said we'll he reached it. out. Nobody got back to him. You owe Anthony a call. Oh, yeah. Call, Give I him a call. Just been, you know, Super just busy. Been crazy. But I'll talk to Anthony. <laughs> All right. Don't worry, Anthony. He'll find you. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. Well, Paul, listen, I appreciate all you're doing I, and whatever we can do to support and make things better. I just get so overwhelmed when I think about it all. It just, it just seems, and, and especially when you get, um, when you try to help and you get, I mean, <laughs> slander, slander, let's yeah. talk about libel, libel and slander. Yeah. Um, but, uh, um, and I'm thinking very seriously about suing the LA times because that was overt slander. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. you know, I just don't, we wanna... need a billionaire friend to help us. I know but Peter Thiel's got to help me. <laughs> There's out there. I, I just want to end it. I, I'll just end this way. There's an old quote. I think it's by Edmund Burke. Don't, you don't hold me to it, but the quote is say, said, the only thing that's required for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. I am aware of that, that, that phrase, uh, but I do understand how it happens now. Uh, a, yeah. a lot of things that I historically across the historical sweep, I couldn't understand how certain things happen. Now I see it. Lots now of stuff. You get it. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. There's a price. There's a price to be paid. That's why. That's why you know courageous people do these things. Well, uh, that's the thing. Really, it, it is the time for courage, and and I, I'm happy to talk to all the opposing. Do you talk to the opposing points of view? I'm happy to bring them in and talk to them. I, I try to. Yeah. I, I, I want people. I want people to defend the status quo. Yeah, I want I want people to basically say, yeah, well, maybe, maybe there's something we're missing or they have some point of view that we would refine what we're doing. Yeah, but they are cowards. Yeah. They're cowards and will not come out and talk. And that's the craziest well, thing to me. The, be the, be the best argument, the argument that I love is when they say, no, 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 no. We are evidence based. We everything that we do, our programs are our programs right. that are based on yeah. research. Right. Let me tell you something. No. I've got research, too. Yeah. It's the last five years of data 
of how homelessness has increased, how capacity has increased, how mental illness among the homeless has increased, yeah. all while funding has increased. That's the, that should be the same level of data. That should be the same level of evidence. But for some reason, you know, their evidence is superior. I mean, just, just look at, just look at the success of permanent supportive housing in Los Angeles. And you could say you've got all the evidence that you want, but people see with their eyes and, and they hear with their ears and they don't understand why it doesn't match. And that's the kind of that's the kind of energy that we need to help people so that we can overcome these challenges and actually start ending the suffering on the streets. Yeah. And and by the way, uh, evidence basis in mental health research. Don't even start me. I, I've been through so many incarnations of evidence based approaches to things that turned out to be categorically false uh, that, right. that I worked in the field long enough to see that multiple cycles of that kind of thing. So but, this, but these are those are the objections. Those are the objections that regular citizens, they, they get stumped on. And they're like, well, I don't, I don't understand. You know, I thought you said that you've got an end to homelessness. We're going to end homelessness in 5, right. 10, 20 years. It's been 20 years. We haven't ended homelessness. It's been, oh, but your programs been, are based on evidence. Housing first started in the 80s, didn't it? It's like 40 years. Well, I'm just, I'm just talking about when, uh, yeah, housing first started in the Bush administration, but it was very kind of disjointed. It was kind of a, it was kind of community oriented program. It was actually its initial iterations were really, really good. They were hmm. very well intentioned. I think what what really happened in 2009 when they started when they statutorily codified the uh, continuums of care and they started pouring all this money in with all of these restrictions. I yeah. think that's when you started seeing some real challenges. And and if you look at the data in terms of unsheltered homelessness. Uh, unsheltered homelessness was declining in our country until about 2013 excuse me, 2013, when a lot of these new guidance and a lot of these new requirements started hitting the, uh, the community-based programs, and then you started seeing, you know, unsheltered homelessness increase again. So there's, there's some great arguments to be made, and, and we, need to, we need to coalesce, we need to equip citizens, and we need to focus. We need to focus on certain specific things, the low-hanging fruit that we could get after. And, and you know, elections have consequences, but also, you know, there's no end to real citizen advocacy. People, pe if I want, I want people to match their indignation at the humanitarian crisis with their level of activism for what they want to do. Well, it'll be interesting. It'll be interesting to see if it, uh, if, if we can get people to shout louder than the people that have been shouting so loud to keep things the way it is. I hope so. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have faith in our democracy, and I have faith in people. And I just I, I know that there's a, a, a whole strand of political correctness and there's a whole strand of activism that's going on. But at the end of the day, you, you've got you know, we've got very specific things that we want. We want people cared for. We want our communities improved. These are these are not mutually exclusive things. Uh, we need to focus and we need to rally and we need to advocate in a very specific way. And and I, I even know some communities have created political action committees to uh, to elect people who are are on the same page so that they can clean up the communities and they can do the things that are. I that think are going that's to that may be the way you're going to have to do this. That that sounds like that kind of makes sense in terms of getting things done. Susan, any questions from your? Well, I'm say? just you know look what we did to save the country from COVID. I mean, we were able to get America to buckle in and make change you know and we're 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 ahead of other countries i mean but we still have a homeless problem you know it's just it, it's astounding that we're not putting that much effort and there's you know i don't know how many do you think homeless people they're mostly on the west coast yeah. where it's the worst right. but um yeah. how many are there like two hundred fifty thousand? yeah probably two hundred thousand. Well, according to according to hud there's a there's about a half a million folks that are homeless all across the country that's incredible and according to hud the point in time count, there's there's about 260,000, almost 300,000 that are considered unsheltered homeless. But you got to understand, Los Angeles, this high stakes, 25% of the entire homeless population in the country is in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Yep. 25%. Why is that? It's not a mistake. Mm. 
We make it easy to be homeless. We make it easy to be addicted to drugs. Uh, we don't provide the kind of capacity care and treatment for the mentally ill. And so the results are what you see on your streets. Mm -hmm. and, 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 there's, and, and these things didn't happen by mistake. They happened because there were bad choices made and there were unintended consequences. And the result is the devastation that you're seeing on the street. My invitation is let's think about things with the, these things with a sober mind. Mm -hmm. Let's become educated. Uh, let's let's recognize the status quo for what it is. If they've got a great argument, great. Let me see it. Let me see it in practice. Let me see how it's reduced, actually reduced homeless numbers, not only in the communities, but also across the country. They can't do it. And that's the that's the encouragement that I give to people is we're, we've been on the back foot on this thing. We need to organize and we need to focus and we need to advocate not just for uh, housing, but housing that heals. A friend of mine came up with this amazing, amazing slogan. We need to advocate for housing that heals, mm -hmm. not just housing. Agreed. Mm -hmm. All right, my friend. Well, good to talk to you as always. And hopefully people learn something from this conversation. Um, where else would you like them to go to learn more about what's going on? Um, I, I'd love them to go to, you know, www.hopestreetcoalition.org. Um, they can find me on Twitter. They can find me on Facebook. Um, I, I, there, I, there's some other organizations that are doing great things. Um, I want to say that, uh, there's a program called Healing Minds NOLA out of New right. Orleans. It's yeah, Healing Minds things. Healing Mind NOLA has one of the best little um, video series that out there yes. that really looks at this problem from every angle. Although mm -hmm. some of this legislative stuff I'm still hearing for the first time. It's, there's always more to the <laughs> nonsense that, yeah. in here. Um, there's also, you know, there's also Heart, Heart Forward, uh, Carrie Morrison's podcast. She does great stuff out of Hollywood. Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of the center in Hollywood. They're reaching out to uh, to just create community among the folks that are disadvantaged. Um, treatment Advocacy Center is a great organization in Washington, D.C. that's focused on treatment of folks who have serious mental illness. So there's a lot of resources out there. And um, I think that, uh, um, you know, people people don't have a, a I think the biggest challenge, there's two big challenges. The, the one big challenge is that people have been sold this notion that housing is some kind of panacea or cure-all to all the different complexities of homelessness. Right. And we, you know, look out the look out the window. We know that that's not true. Right. I mean, even even Council President Nuri Martinez said the status quo is simply not working. Just look out the window and you'll see increases. That's that's one of the challenges. But I think the other challenge is that we we failed to connect the dots between homelessness and the 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 absolute abysmal treatment for addiction and mental illness. Once we start connecting those dots, uh, things look very different, and and you can you can advocate much more confidently for things uh, other than just you know housing. You know, we need yeah. to talk about appropriate housing for the right. mentally ill and addicted. I, I want to repeat the Healing Minds NOLA, uh, the New Orleans group put together a really interesting video series where you can learn more about all these the complexities of the clinical side of this um, for the, and the legal side, too. That was the other thing she got into in quite a bit detail. All right, yeah. Paul, we thank you. And, um, you know, HopeStreetCoalition.org, and we'll look for you in the future, maybe check in in a while and see how things are going. Yeah. All Thanks right. so much, Drew. Thank right, you, friend. Susan. Talk to you Enjoy soon. being on the show. Have a Bye. great weekend. And Susan, okay. I'm going to wrap myself up here. Uh, we've been going for an hour and 20, and I think um, I'm pooped out. You're pooped? Yeah. Um, um, to poop to pop. That's right. Uh, and you've got me doing another thing in about an hour. So tired, I, tired, so tired of, of being admired. <laughs> tired of playing the game. Everybody was very um, helpful on the stream today. Good. Okay, well, let's um, hope that we learn something and do something and push Paul forward further. I, I just get overwhelmed when I hear about this stuff. It just it gets to be, it gets to be too exhausting for me. Uh, yeah, there's a lot to be done, but I I feel like we, as a country, we've shown that we're able to control our environment and help people. You know, and I'm hoping that you know this will draw more light to the inefficiency of, of our ability to help sick people that are really sick. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you I, 
500,000 people, like we were worried about 500,000 people dying of COVID, mm -hmm. but we're not worried about 500,000 people on the street That's right. getting raped and mm -hmm. murdered and mm -hmm. taking drugs and pooping everywhere and making hey, everybody's their best life, best yeah, life. And, and and creating more problems for other people who are tax paying good people who just want to have a business and keep their streets clean or whatever i mean we're all trying our best but it just i i'm i'm hoping that we can look at it a little closer now and i hope things change all right. Well, thank you all for being and here. And I always have to get on my soapbox at the end. I'm trying not to gaslight you. We are. <laughs> not gaslighting. Joshua it's doesn't like when I do it's that. It's a little different. <laughs> um, it, uh, it, it is. Uh, I'm trying to have mindfulness, as Joshua there would you go. say. Uh, and Tom Cigar says, would you please gaslight Drew? Uh, <laughs> so uh, we appreciate all the Twitch guys that came by today, too. Yeah, the Twitch guys were nice. And uh, everybody was happy. I'm... Uh, you're going to be traveling to New York tomorrow. Right, I'll be traveling. You'll be traveling on Monday, so we won't be able to yeah. get back to you guys again until Tuesday. If we can't. Yeah, you you have to do something on Tuesday, but we'll be we'll be back. We're, we're going to be hosting Cat Timp's wedding in our apartment building. Is that talk about it? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's getting married, and we're having it at our apartment, but only 30 people because there are rules. And, COVID uh, rules. So I'm helping the bride this week. So all right, great. I don't know who's if we'll have anybody on. It'll probably just be Drew talking to you and saying hi. Are we going down to Orange County the following weekend? Sound won't Anthony be. Anthony Brown wants to know because I I could swing by and give a talk at his place if. Uh, sure, go ahead. It's Mother's Day weekend. Oh. Um. So right, Susan, whatever you want to do. That you're not being serious, right? It is. It's Mother's Day weekend. I have to go down Friday because I had a water break and I have to okay. meet okay. the okay. contractors. Okay. So Anthony, and maybe. The, I'm going to put it on my calendar to go by Anthony's place on Friday the 7th That's to fine. give a talk. I'll be busy. I'm going to be working with the asbestos people on Friday. and I don't have enough problems with co contractors these days. I, I have to go clean up another house. So. I get it. But so, it's okay. So I there mean, you go, Anthony. These are small problems. We're looking so. at Friday. How's that sound to you? Does it sound good? Uh, yeah, that's fine. What's he say? Yeah, go. I'm not going to be. I'm going to be busy. So you can go, Sam. Uh, no, I'm t I want Anthony. I can't go. I have. I, I know, have a I'm meeting. I'm looking for Anthony. Well, you have a here. thing at eleven. You okay, have so a, Anthony, let's set that up. You have something at eleven or twelve, though. You have uh, a show that day. Canadian MTV. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it'll you be have the, the Canadian MTV. So it'll be the. So you afternoon. have to go after. Yeah. And then if if and we won't be doing a dose that day, right? Because unless no. we do it down there. No, that's fine. No. Don't, don't do have it. To. Okay. No, I gotta. I gotta pack and okay. go do all that stuff okay so anthony let's work on that thank you all for being here and we will uh, talk to you on tuesday anyone who's watched me over the years knows that i'm obsessed with hydrolyte in my opinion the best oral rehydration product on the market i literally use it every day my family uses it when i had covid i'm telling you hydrolyte contributed to my recovery kept me hydrated now with things finally reopening back around the country the potential exposure to the common cold is always around and like always hydrolyte has got your back hydrolyte plus immunity my new favorite starts with their fast absorbing electrolytes and adds a host of great ingredients plus each single serving easy pour drink mix contains a thousand milligrams of vitamin c 300 milligrams of elderberry extract hydrolyte plus immunity comes in convenient easy to pour sticks that rapidly dissolve in water make a great tasting drink has 75 percent less sugar than your typical sports drink Uses all natural flavors, gluten-free, dairy-free, caffeine-free, non-GMO, and even vegan. Hydrolyte Plus Immunity is also now available in ready-to-drink bottles at the Walmart next to the pharmacy. Or as always, you can find it by visiting hydrolyte.com slash Dr. Drew. Again, that is H-Y-D-R-A-L-Y-T-E dot com slash D-R-D-R-E-W. Be sure to use the code Dr. Drew 25 for a special discount. I've struggled with various digestive issues over the years, so gut health is extremely important to me. Now, while gut health awareness has increased, it has led to a wellness trend that inspired a host of kind of questionable marketing claims and even false claims. You've seen the word probiotic attached to all kinds of supplements, drinks, and more, and they may claim to deliver the healthy microorganisms our guts need for proper function, but all too often, the promises are really too good to be true. Thankfully, I became aware of a company called Seed and their flagship product, the Daily Symbiotic. 
That's right. Seed's Daily Symbiotic offers 24 clinically researched strains of microorganisms in a single dose. These strains support gut, skin, and heart health and promotes regularity, sometimes within as little as 24 to 48 hours. To me, what really sets Seed's Daily Symbiotic apart is its delivery system. This is my supply. While some products may offer the right strains, they are fragile and they rarely survive the trip through your gut. Seed uses a capsule in capsule design that helps ensure that 100% of the probiotics reach your colon where they matter most. Now, I've been taking Seed's Daily Symbiotic, and I encourage you to check out their story and the science behind what they do. To try it for yourself, just go to seed.com slash Dr. Drew. Use code Dr. Drew for 20% off your first month of Daily Symbiotic. That is seed.com slash Dr. Drew. Use code D-R-D-R-E-W, Dr. Drew.